Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and I do have a reason for calling it die gas. I'll get to that in a minute. So now for something completely different, right? This is a topic focused on the engine, which have been has been mentioned some uh, throughout the day. <clears throat> I'm at uh, uh, in the mechanical engineering department at Colorado State University. I uh, work with Sybil Charvel some, and she asked me to if I wanted to give a presentation uh, on scrubbers, and so I expanded that a bit to talk about engines as well, which is. Uh, what I'm more comfortable talking about because that's my research area. Okay, so I'll, I'll hit on uh, these topics here. Stationary gas engines, uh, die gas characteristics, engine design modifications for die gas, gas scrubbers, and um, look at one uh, die gas installation. So when you look at utilizing an internal combustion engine to generate power from die gas, there's a few different options for engine design. And they're shown here. The, the first one is taking a diesel engine and aerating the, uh, or adding biogas to the intake air. And that works pretty well, except for you still have to have two fuels on site. And you're limited as far as the percent um, substitution of the diesel. So you can operate about 40 to 50 percent on die gas with that mode. <clears throat> so it's a pretty simple uh, way to do it, but there's some limitations. Spark ignited stoichiometric gas engine, that's another class of internal combustion engines. They do not have as um, high efficiency. Th this is basically a industrial engine large industrial engine similar to what's in your automobile. It operates under stoichiometric conditions. It uses a three-way catalyst for emission reduction, which may be a problem for uh, different types of biogas. Uh, they get lower efficiency because they have uh, higher combustion temperatures. The third, um, the third type is a spark-ignited lean burn gas engine, and that's what I'll be focusing on that's sort of the ideal uh, engine to be used because it has low emissions without exhaust after treatment, high efficiency, and high power density. This slide shows an example of different stationary gas engines, which are uh, actually stationary lean burn gas engines. So there's a lot of different uh, manufacturers. Uh, uh, that sell into the U.S. market, uh, starting from the left there and going counterclockwise, MAN, uh, Cummins Onan, Waukesha, and Yenbacher, both owned by GE, Caterpillar, and this happens to be the CAT 3516 that we have in our laboratory, uh, Wurzilla engines, and Gwascore and Kubota. So there, there are others, but these are kind of the main players in the U.S. market. And Gwascore engines are, I think, um, are, are definitely a, a leader in the biogas market because of the modifications that have been done to promote high efficiency, uh, high reliability operation on, on biogas. Trends over the last, uh, say, 10 to 20 years are for these, this class of engine are higher BMEP, which is power density. So this plot in the upper right there shows BMEP, which is brake mean effective pressure. That's a power density term. And as you increase that by adding more and more mass into the cylinder by boosting the intake, the efficiency goes up because many of the losses are constant. Similar to that, <clears throat> uh, compression ratio can also be increased to improve efficiency there at the lower left. The limitation for both of these uh, trends is knock or detonation. And that is a fuel property. And 
it's something that needs to be considered when, when running biogas. There's a trace there at the lower right that shows a knock uh, event uh, in the cylinder. Essentially, the pressure spikes and then rings, and that has a number of detrimental effects to the engine, which I don't have time to go into. Okay, die gas characteristics. So this slide kind of gets at why I'm, call I'm using the term die gas. So, so biogas is, uh, in my view, more of a generic term. And so there are two types of biogas that are uh, discussed in the literature. Um, wood gas, which is from a gasifier, also car called producer gas. And die gas from sewage processing, landfills, etc. And they both have their own set of challenges in terms of um, running uh, industrial gas engines, uh, running the fuel in industrial gas engines. So the wood gas composition shown there in the middle right, that has a high concentration of nitrogen in blue, carbon monoxide in the, the gray, and then the green is uh, hydrogen. So this is hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and then methane and some trace species. So the main combustion components are carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And those knock readily. Digester gas has a primary component of methane and CO2. And this composition does not knock readily. In fact, it's more resistant to knock than natural gas. And the natural gas is shown up here, mostly methane with ethane, propane, uh, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and some higher hydrocarbons. So, so I use the term digester gas to specifically refer to this composition at the bottom right, and that's what I'm focusing my talk on. To give you an idea of how much the properties vary for different gaseous fuels. This plot shows methane number. So methane number is analogous to octane number, the number that's shown on the gas pumps. The higher the number, the more resistant to knock. And let me just point out uh, a couple bars on this chart. This 61.5 methane number is for, is for wood gas. The uh, high carbon monoxide, high hydrogen. This 139.1 is for die gas. Um, and then typical natural gas range is shown here. So what this says is that actually die gas could operate with compression ratios higher than typical natural gas engines. Uh, although that's not typically done, that could be um, a design change to improve the efficiency. Hydrogen sulfide, the biggest uh, issue as far as uh, contaminants and what it does to the engine, typical levels, typical levels, uh, 2,000 to 5,000 parts per million. The impact on engines, it corrodes copper-based bearing materials, contaminates oil via blow-by. So blow-by is when the combustion gas goes around the rings, gets into the crankcase, Combined with water, that forms acids that attack uh, metals. Combustion of hydrogen sulfide also produces um, SO2, which is a atmospheric pollutant uh, similar to NOx. And the bottom table there shows some properties of H2S, and I'll just point out a couple of them. One is the odor threshold. 0.47 parts per billion, so that's very low. The other is the eight-hour time-weighted average OSHA um, limit of 10 parts per million compared to carbon monoxide at 50 parts per million. It's a, uh, you know, it's not something, it's something that's of concern when you're working in an enclosed area. Okay, moving on to engine design modifications, <clears throat> I think it's best to show an example of how an engine is modified for uh, biogas. 
die gas, die gas. So die gas has a very low heating value, about forty about sixty percent of natural gas. Um, so this example looks at a Waukesha uh, D16 engine, 152 millimeter bore, 1.1 megawatt at uh, 1800 RPM. And this diagram here on the right is a typical uh, gas carburetor setup or mixer. This, the air comes into this venturi where the pressure is, is decreased. And then that draws in fuel from the fuel system. And some changes that need to be made to flow. It, backing up a step, the goal here is to meet the same power requirements as natural gas. So not, we do not want to derate the engine because that means that we're paying a much higher cost per horsepower. And there's no reason to derate the engine if changes, the appropriate changes are made. So the regulator spring is replaced with a stiffer spring, in this case, to increase fuel pressure. The fuel piping from the regulator to the mixer is increased from 3 inch to 4 inch. The mixer insert flow area for die gas is increased by 2.3 times relative to natural gas. So those are changes made to the gas carburetor to allow more gaseous flow into the airstream. As far as operating parameters, this plot here at the, at the right shows an operating envelope for natural gas. And the operating envelope, and this is a one gram per brake horsepower line. That's a typical emission uh, limit for new gas engines. So we're operating between knock and misfire. On these axes, axes are is lambda, which is proportional to air fuel ratio, and timing advance. So as we advance the timing and go rich, we get into knock. As we go lean and retard the timing, we get into misfire. When the engine is operated on um, die gas, this envelope moves in this direction and establishes a new operating. Air, uh, region and the changes that are made there the timing is moved from 21 to 30 degrees before top dead center and lambda goes from 1.7 to 1.42 to meet the same NOx limit so slightly lower boost is required <laughs> okay then on to gas scrubbers and this table shows uh, die gas specifications for different engine manufacturers, Gloss Corian, Bacher, and Caterpillar. Focusing on the H2S spec, the highest is uh, the gas, the Gloss core spec at 990 parts per million. Uh, Yenbacher has the lowest uh, limit and uh, Caterpillar is uh, pretty close to Gloss core. <coughs> And so those are the limits that you need to stay below if the warranty is not is going to be valid, is going to remain valid. So to remove H2S, I'm just going to talk about a couple different techniques that are commercially available. Iron oxide or iron sponge is one approach uh, where we have iron oxide and impregnated material. The removal reactions and regeneration reaction, which I understand doesn't work too well, are shown here. Another approach is uh, biotrickling. And if you're familiar with uh, the company Martin Machinery that has done a lot of these installations, this is their desired approach or their, their choice for at least large installations. And in this case, the filter media uh, provides an environment for the establishment of a bacteria biofilm. As the biogas comes in contact with the biofilm, hydrogen sulfide is solubilized and subsequently oxidized by microbes. Sulfur and sulfate compounds are formed as byproducts and are collected at the bottom and may be purged with recirculation water. And so we just, the basic configuration is 
you have a packed media, you come in and out with the biogas or digas, and then there's some uh, air and water and nutrient injection uh, hardware. Okay, so I'm going to look at one digas installation uh, as an example, uh, which I visited. This is Windy Ridge Dairy Farm in Fair Oaks, Indiana. And this is a Martin Machinery installation. Just some of the basic facts here. The raw die gas contains 4,000 to 5,000 parts per million H2S. The biotripler is used to reduce H2S to 200 to 300 parts per million. Typical gas composition is shown there. This, this uh, installation has two V16 Grosper engines rated at 7. 188 kilowatts mechanical actually at 1200 RPM and the gas flow from the digester is shown there that goes to both engines 525 CFM. The engines typically produce 730 kilowatts electrical each. That's just over a hundred percent of the dairy electricity in the winter and about two-thirds in the summer. The the oil needs to be changed more frequently because of the H2S. They're currently changing it every 500 hours and are using a oil analysis schedule to try and lengthen that over time. And it's currently been running about 24-7 uh, for about one year um, with, with no rebuild. Okay, this basic schematic of the facility is shown here. Um, the digester is here, raw manure in, digested manure out, and the biogas comes out, goes through a rough water drop out, blower into the biotrickler, another blower through a chiller to um, reduce the water content, and then into the engines. The heating of the digesters is carried out by these two heat exchangers. The first one is the jacket water uh, from uses the jacket water of the engine and then the second one uses the exhaust of the engine and here's some pictures of the installation uh, go into a great amount of detail here this is the entrance to the digester this truck sort of scoops and vacuums up the manure dumps it into the entrance to the digester this is the digester itself. It's 20 feet deep. Um, the one of the engines shown here, the biotrickler, the iron sponge unit is used just when the biotrickler is down. And then um, here's the biotrickler control skid. And here's this sulfur and sulfate compound that's collects at the bottom of the biotrickler. And in one year's time, it has not needed to be uh, cleaned out. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? On your schematic, you show that the chiller for the die gas to go through this before goes into the engines. What's your inlet and outlet temperature still there when one of the things that goes through? I'm not sure what the inlet and outlet temperature is there. It, it's just a, you know, it, it would just be a, you know, a typical refrigeration cycle um, chiller, and you know the the biogas, the die gas going into the generators through the fuel system train needs to be the water needs to be reduced. Otherwise, you get um, condensing of water in the fuel train. So, so that's the condensation. Of the of the gas. That's right. It's for it's to remove the water. Yep. So it is the gas basically operating the temperature after those two triggers? Yes. Yeah, it's not going into the the engine's uh, chill chill significantly. Um, one of the American this one's a little bit. Um, not to sound like a language piece or anything like that. This is an emerging industry, and any emerging industry terminology. It can't just be so cumbersome. But the sooner that we can all converge on common terminology, the 
in our industry can contribute to accelerating this development. Um, we very, very, very strongly advocate um, no longer using the term biogas for gas is derived from thermal chemical processes, even if that thermal chemical process is using biomass. Um, only from the perspective that it allows us to very discreetly talk about compositions where the methane is a greater proportion of it rather than there is a lesser proportion of it. And then it allows us to line up the appropriate conditioning, scrubbing, upgrading technologies with the dominant compositions. So from a thermal energy standpoint, when we refer to those as sim gas, where generally uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen are predominant rather than methane, and we use biogas where methane is the predominant. And just to reply no, that's that's a good point, and you know when you read through the literature, it's all over the map, and and so the definition of biogas, syngas, gas, dye gas, it's anybody's guess. And, and the, what, what my issue is, is a lot of times the producer gas or wood gas or synthetic gas is lumped with digester gas. And they're so different in composition. It's a, it's a, you know, it's an issue for uh, the engine application. And just from a dollars and cents standpoint, um, uh, I could go into the detail here. We got to make it quick though, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dollars and cents tax of it are and how regulations and how incentives are delivered that anaerobic digestion gas has been the regular stepchild for as long as anybody can remember. And it is way too often omitted because of definitional problems. So from the American Biogas Council standpoint, we have sort of worked full time on definitions. And just moving out with their regulations and legislation and um, grants and everything else have definitional issues which inadvertently exclude the anaerobic digestive 